is my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you Sin was great, your love was greater. No what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is! What a wonderful name it is! The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is! Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Because death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. You silence the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all. Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Jesus, we love you. Oh, 
All things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again. You cause your sun to shine on darkest night. All that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Good morning, church. I want to talk to you today out of the Old Testament. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 is where we're going to be looking today. And looking at uh, one of the prophets of the Old Testament named Elijah. Uh, many uh, amazing, uh, miraculous things are associated with Elijah. He called down fire from heaven on Mount Carmel. He uh, was taken up in a chariot of fire uh, instead of dying. He went to meet the Lord in a miraculous way. 
And yet we want to look at really kind of a low point in the life of Elijah. In uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, Elijah has proclaimed that it wouldn't rain, uh, and it didn't. God fed him by a brook and provided meat and bread. Uh, Ravens brought them uh, to him, brought the food to him. And then the brook dried up. He went and lived with a widow woman, and through Elijah's presence, God supplied for the widow woman oil and meal that continued throughout the drought. Uh, The widow woman's son died, and Elijah, through the power of God, raised the child again from the dead. And then Elijah goes and has this great conflict, this great meeting with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And there, uh, after uh, almost a full day of the other prophets trying to call down fire from heaven, uh, Elijah prays and fire comes down from heaven and consumes the altar and the sacrifice, the wood and the water, and God performs an amazing miracle. Then Elijah declares that it's going to rain, and it begins to rain. And we come to 1 Kings chapter 19, of verse number 1, and it says that Ahab, who was the king, told Jezebel the queen, all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a message, a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Jezebel says to Elijah, I'm going to have you killed. And when he saw that, Elijah saw that he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. And he said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of the food, of that food, 40 days and 40 nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave. And he spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And so he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your uh, altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. And then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? A couple of things I want us to look at this morning. Uh, I'm looking at the renewing of the spirit that God brought in the life of Elijah. Elijah really enters into a period of, uh, I think what is best described as depression. Now, let me just say a word before we get going this morning. Um, When I talk about depression here, I'm talking about uh, these feelings of anxiety and doubt and, and, and being down in a really difficult way. Elijah prayed to God that he could die. He was uh, very upset. And yet, I want to try to as we look at this passage today, I, I want to acknowledge that uh, this isn't some kind of cure-all for every uh, feeling of anxiety or depression that you may have. Um, you may be dealing with 
uh, some, some long-term issues and, and under the care of a doctor or, or a counselor. And, and I don't uh, purport that this message is a cure-all for that. But rather, God's Word does give us real good principles, godly principles that we can use to fight some of these feelings and these issues in our life. And so I'm not uh, encouraging anybody to go away from maybe some treatment that they're having or, or medication that they're, that they're on. But I would encourage you to also look to God's Word. And you may be really like me. Uh, I've, I've struggled in my, in my emotions over the last couple of weeks sometimes. Some days I'm just not feeling the energy or the motivation that I really know that I should have. And so I've kind of gone to God's word and I really feel like God has given me this message for this week. And so I want to encourage you with what Elijah was feeling, how God responded to him, and how we can make application to our own life with some of these things. The first thing that I see uh, about Elijah's depression is that he was focused on his feelings more than on the facts. Matter of fact, he says uh, to, to God, he said, I, I want to die. I I'm, I'm done. I'm tired. I've had enough. And yet, the facts of the life of Elijah, the facts of what God was doing were different than how Elijah felt. See, the fact was, God was in control. He had brought great victories. If you go back just one chapter to 1 Kings chapter 20, or 1 Kings 18, that is the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. There he faced off against hundreds of false prophets. A crowd that when he presented, hey, listen, you need to choose God or these false gods. And the Bible says that the crowd was silent. Nobody was with him, and yet Elijah stands in the power of God. He, he really makes fun of these other prophets and then prays a short and simple prayer, and fire falls from heaven. And God gives an amazing victory there. Not only that, but Elijah speaks the word, and God begins to form, in, at first, just a small cloud. And then the sky grows dark, and rain that hadn't come in years poured out upon the land. God was showing himself mighty, and he was showing himself in control. And yet, that's not the way Elijah felt. But it didn't change the fact that God was in control. Not only that, the fact was, Elijah wasn't done. God wasn't done with Elijah. Elijah still had more to do as the prophet of God. At, when God speaks to him in the still small voice, and he comes to him and says, Elijah, what are you doing here in verse 13 of 1 Kings 19? That scripture continues in verse 14, and he said, Elijah says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone, alone am left, and they seek to take my life. He repeats in vo verse 14 what he had said earlier. He said, look, this is all that's happened. And they're, they're wanting to kill me. And this is what God said. The Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Mahoah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill. Whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. God says a couple of things here. He says, Elijah, I've got work for you to do. There's going to be a new king of Judah, a new king of Israel, a new prophet of God, and you are going to anoint all of them. In the case of Elisha, 
he was going to mentor him for several more years. He said, not only that, you're not alone. There are 7,000 prophets who have not bowed their knee, who have not kissed this false god. They are still faithful to me. And Elijah felt all alone. But the facts were, God was still at work. Elijah felt done. But the fact was, God still had more for him to do. Elijah felt isolated and like he was the only one. But the fact was, there were thousands more who were ready to serve God. See, I would encourage you not to get in touch with your feelings so much as to get in touch with the truth, to recognize what the truth of God's word says about you and your condition, your situation. It's interesting, even in our phrasing today, I hear people say, I feel like, and they'll really state things that are facts. But we think so much about our feelings. And we, 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 we talk about and we focus on how we feel. But I would encourage you, and, and I'm not saying to ignore how you feel, but if we will focus on what is true, the truth, the facts, will begin to alter our feelings. As we recognize who and what we are in Jesus Christ, all that we have in him, it will, those facts, those truths, will affect our feelings. And so we need to uh, get in touch with the truth. Jesus said this in John chapter 8. In verse 31, Jesus said to the Jews who, who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus said, if you're my followers, you're going to be in my word. And my word, which is the truth, is going to lead to freedom. Our, those facts will affect our feelings. He goes on in verse uh, 36 and says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I, I want to feel that freedom, but whether I feel it or not, the truth of God's word says that as a child of God, I am free. I don't have to be encumbered by the chains and the weight of this world. I have freedom in Jesus Christ. And so even if I don't feel that way, I can look to the truth of God's word. I can focus on those facts. Some other mistakes that Elisha made was not, or Elijah made, was not just focusing on his feelings, but he also, he compared himself to others. In verse 4 of 1 Kings 19, he, he makes this statement where he says, it is enough now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Man, I'm just, I'm not better than anybody else. And it wasn't that Elijah had a spirit of humility, but rather it was desperation. You know what? My life is futile. Well, I don't even see the point. I should be like my fathers, like my ancestors. I just want to die. But the fact was, God had a mission for Elijah. He still had things for him to do. And uh, Elijah was looking around and comparing himself to others. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 says, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. You want to know what a foolish thing is? Scripture says, to compare yourself to other people. To look at others and say, well, I, I don't measure up there. I, I'm not as good as, as, as those folks. We need to recognize that we are unique to God Almighty. He created us that way. He has a plan for us. And he is not done with us. Not only did Elisha, Elijah focus on his feelings, and not only did he compare himself to others, but he blamed himself for things that weren't even his fault. He looked around and, and the circumstances of life, 
he began to internalize and take those upon himself. He says in verse 10, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. He, he talks about all the things that the nation had done, and he carries the weight of that upon himself. Now, Elijah was the prophet of God for the nation of Israel. He was the leading prophet at that time. But his job was to declare the truth of God's word, to declare the message of God. How it was received and how it was applied, that was up to the nation. And the nation had rejected the words of Elijah. They had built altars to false gods. They had torn down altars to real gods. They had killed other true prophets. Elijah's friends, his classmates, those that he labored with, men had died. And so it was a real danger, and it was a real difficult time, but Elijah was taking on more than he should have. He couldn't control the reaction of the people. His job was to declare the truth, the word that God had brought to him. And so we don't need to take upon ourselves more than what God has assigned us. And then finally, Elijah exaggerated the negative. He said, I'm the only one. There's, there's nobody else, God. I'm all that's left. I'm all by myself. But that wasn't true. One of the themes that's emerged uh, through this uh, quarantine and, and this co coronavirus has been the idea that we're all in this together. It's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Because what we are not is together. We're not together in church. We're not together at work. We're not together in, in public gatherings. We're not together in so many ways. We talk about social distancing and isolation. And of course, the idea behind that phrase is that we all need to do our part to try to uh, protect those who, who would be uh, devastated by this disease and, and that we are all working together. And yet, it especially at this time, can feel very lonely. I talked to several folks this week who are living by themselves. And I'm quarantined with my family. Uh, that has more pros than cons for sure. Um, and I am enjoying getting to spend time with my family. Uh, we watch the video together. And so if I make any kind of uh, um, illustration or say anything about my family, their ears kind of perk up. They start looking around at each other. What's he going to say? Um, but I have nothing but great things to say about my family. And especially to my daughter-in-law, Erin, who hasn't been mentioned in many of my illustrations, but is my favorite daughter-in-law. And I certainly I have enjoyed getting to spend time with her. But some folks, they're by themselves. And in this era of social isolation, they are truly alone. But you are not forgotten by God Almighty. And while you may feel isolated in your house or your apartment, you are not alone. God is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And it's important to know that there are others in your same predicament. That's what God told Elijah. He said, listen, there's 7,000 other prophets who are as faithful to me as you are. They, they, they desire to serve me with the same zeal that you have. You're not alone. And so I want to see, uh, as we uh, continue to look at this this morning, God's response or some of the remedy for the way that Elijah felt. First of all, it's important to take care of our physical needs. In, in verses 5 through 7 of 1 Kings 19, it says that Elijah, after, after running, uh, he lay and slept under a broom tree. Now, it's interesting if you read the entire uh, background here in verses or chapters 18 and then in 19. Elijah has this 
this significant day on Mount Carmel. Uh, it, it's, it's spiritual battle, and, and he's there facing the people, and it must have been very stressful, very exhausting. After that, as rain comes, the Bible says that he girded up his loins, and he, he ran, and he outran the chariot of the king to meet the king at the gate to declare that God was bringing rain, that God was at work. And it was there at the gate of the city that Elijah receives the message from the queen that she's going to kill him. So he runs for his life, goes to a, a, a town there, drops off his servant, and then goes another day into the, into the wilderness. Elijah has been running. He's exhausted. He's physically spent. And so what does he do? He lays down and sleep. And what does God do? God doesn't come then and try to, try to illustrate a story to Elijah. What he does is he lets him sleep. An angel comes and wakes him up and feeds him, gives him food, gives him water, lets him go back to sleep. He wakes up again and God provides food and water again. It's important in, in this time, in, in this stressful time, in this unusual time that we're going through, to take care of your physical needs. Get rest. For some of you, you, you may say, preacher, I haven't been sleeping well. Well, you know what? I would encourage you to take the time, do the things necessary to, to get sleep. If you're not sleeping well at night, maybe try to take a nap, but do the things to be rested. Take care of yourself physically. Get outside. Get some exercise. Eat right. Don't allow yourself to just stay inside all day and keep the shades drawn and eat junk food. That doesn't lead to a, a healthy outlook on this situation. God gave Elijah rest and food. He helped address his physical needs. Not only that, talk to God. In both uh, 2 Kings chapter, uh, or 2 King, 1 Kings 19, verses 10, and then later, uh, Elijah repeats the same thing. He said, I've been zealous for you. They've, they've torn down your altars. They've done this. They've killed your prophets. And they're trying to kill me, and I'm the only one left. Elijah vents to God. And God doesn't say, how dare you talk to me that way? Now, we need to go to God with respect. We need to recognize that he is the creator of this universe. But he is also our heavenly father. He loves us. And he can take the way that we are feeling. He can take our, our concerns. He can take our frustrations. That's not something that we need to keep bottled up, but we need to go to God. He desires that we would go to him. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He begins that in verse 28 by saying, come to me. Lay your burden down. You need to, you need to come to me, express how you're feeling. God can take that. He wants us to come to him. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7 says, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Sometimes we just need to unload. And we can do that with God. We can take our burdens to him. Elijah did. He said, this is how I feel, God. I just want to die. And God heard him. And God gave him the facts, and God encouraged him. We need to take care of our physical needs. We need to go to God and, and express our frustrations to him. And then we need to get a fresh awareness of God's presence in our life. In verse 11 of 1 Kings 19, God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And before, behold, the Lord passed by in a great and strong wind. This wasn't a, a breeze. The Bible says that this wind tore at the mountain. Trees were toppled and rocks were moved. And then after that, 
came an earthquake. After that came a fire. But God was not in any of those things. God spoke to Elijah in a still, small voice. But we do have a unique opportunity during this time where uh, we are at home, we get the opportunity to get a fresh and a different perspective on our lives, on the things that are important. We have time now to spend in God's word, to spend in prayer, to reach out to those who we genuinely love and care about. We're not encumbered by so many events and, 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 and the hustle and bustle that we, that we often are. For some, I know you're still going to work, or some, you're working from home and you're still busy, but there is opportunity to gain a perspective. And God gave to Elijah a fresh awareness of his power, but also of his plan for Elijah. And so I would encourage you, spend time in God's word. Take some time and, and use, use it to really be in God's word. A couple of the things that I enjoy and, and I would maybe encourage you with, uh, we encourage you to follow along uh, on these notes in, your, in the YouVersion app. One of the things that the YouVersion app offers is uh, audio. It, the Bible can be read to you. One of the things that I enjoy is to take passages of Scripture and read them, but also have them read. Or take some time and read them aloud, where we can allow God's Word to get in us and allow God to speak to us in a fresh and a powerful way. The Bible says that the Word of God is alive and it's powerful. And so we need to spend some time in God's Word. I've already mentioned this, but spend some time in God's creation. I know that we're not supposed to travel to the mountains and, and, and do all of those things, but in a way that simplifies our life. We live in a, in a beautiful environment. We have several days of beautiful weather today and, and in the days to come. I would encourage you to take advantage of that. Go for walks. Spend a little bit of time outside, even if you're just walking around in your yard. Look at God's creation. Ask God uh, to, to, to speak to you. Spend time with him. Take a prayer walk where you just have a conversation with God. And then we need to spend time with God's people. Now you may say, well, preacher, I'd love to do that, but church is closed. But we do have an opportunity to reach out to one another. Maybe we don't have the opportunity to corporately gather and to corporately worship, but we do have the opportunity to reach out to one another. There's messaging apps on social media. We can text one another. We can call, video chat. And I realize those things aren't, aren't as great as going to uh, a coffee with, with a friend, really being able to spend time with one another personally, but we can reach out. And I think one of the things that can happen is we feel isolated. And so what we do is we don't reach out to anybody else. And that only increases those feelings of isolation. And so I would encourage you, spend some time with God's people. And finally, allow God to give you purpose and direction. That's what God did with Elijah. He brought the wind and the earthquake and the fire, and then he spoke to him in a still, small voice, and he said, Elijah, I'm not done with you. God is going to replace this evil king with a new king, and you're going to anoint him. You're going to anoint the kings of Judah and of Israel. God's got a new prophet that you're going to mentor, and you're going to anoint I'm not done with you yet, Elijah. And God is not done with you. I want to close this morning and just encourage you with a verse out of Galatians chapter 5, verse number 1. The New Living Translation puts it this way. So Christ has truly 
set us free. That's interesting, isn't it? Because we feel confined. Uh, confined to wear a mask in public, confined to stay in our car, confined to our homes. We don't feel a lot of freedom right now. But in Christ, the coronavirus doesn't affect. We are free in him. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. Don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. I would encourage you to take some of these principles, to focus on what God has for you during this time, to not focus so much on your feelings, but look at the facts, the truths from God's word, and allow those be, to begin to uh, get into your heart and to affect your feelings in that way. God has made you free. We're free in him. God has not forgotten you. He is not far from us. He, if we know Christ is our Savior, He is right here with us. There's no social, social distancing with the Holy Spirit. He indwells us. God has not left us. And so I hope to, that you can be encouraged by God's Word today. Let's close this morning with a word of prayer. Our gracious God in heaven, Lord, I pray that Your Word would go forth, that it would pierce our hearts, that it might pierce the darkness of depression and anxiety. And God, that your word and the, the example of Elijah would be an encouragement for us today. God, use your word and use this time to make yourself real and to deepen our relationship with you. We love you, God. And we ask this in your holy name, and in the name of our Savior and your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today for our live stream. Uh, we're glad that you've uh, joined with us. Uh, be sure to check out uh, belmarchurch.com, and also check out our Facebook and Instagram uh, feeds. we be posting things throughout the week there. I want to let you know about uh, a special Sunday we're going to celebrate here in two weeks. Two weeks from today is Mother's Day. And uh, for that day, we're going to do a drive-in service at the church. Uh, we're going to invite you to come, stay in your car, stay socially isolated, uh, but we're going to set up a stage outside. You'll be able to tune in on your radio uh, to the service and hear it there. And it's going to be uh, an unusual service, but I think an opportunity for us to be together and yet still safe and socially isolated. We're going to have a special gift for every mother that's there that day. We're going to have a special time for the children, even as they're there in the cars. And so we're excited about that day. Be looking for more information about that. But make plans to join us on Mother's Day for our drive-in service. Have a great week. God bless you.